Some people are kind of curious whether or not there's, if anyone's looked at or even if you have any thoughts about within your eating window, like does it matter if you're having lots of frequent meals or you yeah. eat two meals? Do you? Yeah, so that's a question that uh, comes up very frequently. And actually this is where again, I uh, kind of go back and forth between what we know about metabolism and response to eating. And we know every time we eat a good amount of food, even a good sized snack, um, there is enough sugar in most of the snack that will trigger a insulin response. Our blood glucose will go up. It will stay up for maybe 90 minutes to a couple of hours and then it will come down. So every time we eat, we essentially trigger our insulin to go up slightly. So there is this anabolic hormone going up and staying up for maybe one or two hours. So in that way, our body is getting into that fat storing mode mm -hmm. every time we eat. So with that in mind, I would say uh, the smaller number of meals within that eight or nine hours is better than eating every one hour within that eight to nine hours. Um, but again, this is where we don't have hard data. It's just going by my prediction based on what we know <laughs> from physiology. Right. And for this is again, this might hold true for normal healthy people who's, who do not become hypoglycemic yeah. after six, seven hours of fasting. Right. But we know that there are a lot of people who actually prefer to eat twice. And this is something that we find with many people who adopt TRE that uh, what happens is after 14 to 16 hours of fasting, they are hungry to have a good breakfast. And if they have a good breakfast with enough, say, protein, fat, and some complex carb, then naturally they will not feel hungry for seven to <laughs> eight hours right. easily. Right. And then they have a, another dinner or maybe one snack in between. Mm -hmm. And essentially that has even happened to me. I eat mostly two meals, mm -hmm. my big breakfast, and then I go to dinner and it actually helps me stay productive throughout the day. Mm -hmm. I don't have to waste that one hour for <laughs> looking for food, having right. lunch, <laughs> and then the postprandial dip. Um, so the <laughs> short answer is less number of yeah. meals may be better. The same thing for me. Um, with it depends on what I eat for breakfast, and I've noticed change. Like if I eat like a breakfast that's got higher protein, higher fat, I will be satiated for much longer. Yeah, and as opposed to, or even higher higher fiber. Yeah, as opposed to, for example, if I eat yogurt and some berries. <laughs> yeah, not good. I will no, be, not good at all. <laughs> be hungry a couple of hours <laughs> yeah. later. Uh, the same thing with me. So. <laughs> yeah, so uh, that's definitely uh, not my go-to breakfast. But I also wanted to mention because you mentioned you were mentioning the, you know, what we do know about metabolism and how even you know a, a small amount of food can trigger an insulin response and yeah. you know elevate blood glucose levels. Some people might be thinking, well, what if I just do you know like a ketogenic, just fat only, just eating fat? And the reverse of that would be also, I guess, you know, if you th think about metabolism. We know that high fat meal, you know, if you're going to use that fat as energy, you have to, you know, it has to be imported into the mitochondria. It yeah. undergoes this process called beta oxidation. There's transporters, yeah. carnitol palmitol transferases, yeah. CPT transporters. Those also are regulated by, guess what? Fat. <laughs> fat. <laughs> <laughs> Malonyl CoA inhibits yeah. it. So, yeah. so it, you can eat that fat meal and then, and then eat a smaller fat meal later, and that second meal will probably not be used as energy, but yeah. stored as fat. Yeah, I mean, so that's just, what happened. Right. And also another thing is what we find, um, a lot of people, it's very natural that uh, some people think that a particular diet is rich in protein, that doesn't mean that it's only pure protein. Mm -hmm. um, so one simple example is many people think that lentils are high in protein, so lentils uh, they can just eat lentils and they'll get protein source, but lentils have only up to 25% protein and 70% almost almost 70% carb. <laughs> so yeah. when they eat lentils, they're actually eating a very nice carb-rich and protein-rich diet, and that carb will trigger a good insulin response. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Great, uh, let's see, what are the ones that are really frequently asked? We talked about xenobiotics, obviously yeah. pharmaceuticals. If, if your doctor tells you to take some, a, a pharmaceutical at night, then yeah, then you have to take a night. Yeah. And your doctor overrides 
any other thing right. that you are self-experimenting. And as we were talking about a little bit earlier off camera, xenobiotics themselves yeah. are on a circadian Yeah, clock. xenobiotic metabolism is strongly circadian. And there are three or four major xenobiotic uh, degrading enzymes. Um, uh, so actually, these are the transcription factors that control many of the cytochrome P450s that break down xenobiotics. And these are strongly circadian. And in fact, a lot of the circadian rhythm research, we use one of the xenobiotic regulators as a reporter, <laughs> as <Control>. a marker, <laughs> as a <laughs> because even the circadian clock components are not as robust as the xenobiotic <laughs> metabolizing wow. um, uh, transcription factors and enzymes. So that's why. In terms of xenobiotics, almost every step of xenobiotic absorption, metabolism, excretion is strongly circadian regulated. And that's an emerging area of a new area of circadian rhythm research. So that is um, what time of the day a medication may be better absorbed and uh, better, uh, most effective because any medication that we take, it's actually going and interacting with a protein in most cases. It's going and inhibiting or stopping a protein or activating that protein. What if that protein is actually not there? Then we are essentially taking a drug with no benefit right. and the protein turns up. So for example, we take the medication in the morning, but the protein actually comes to play in the evening. So then this medication has no impact and then the doctor will keep on increasing the doses so that it comes to a point where there is some medication that's remaining at the end of the day, it will start to have its intended effect. Wow. But then the side effects, the adverse side effects will go up with the increased dosing. So that's why there is now interesting, there is a lot of interest on what time of the day a given drug target reaches its peak. And can we match drug timing with its target so that we can have the same effect with less of the drug mm -hmm. uh, so that we can reduce adverse side effect and we can increase efficacy. So that's a whole new area of research that's going on. And the uh, small or the most impactful statement about that is recently people have found that nearly 70% of FDA approved drugs have their targets cycling in the body. So that means for 70% of FDA drugs, just timing can make it a drug or make it a poison. Wow. So that's a, that's will, that will be an emerging area of research in circadian rhythm. Yeah. I mean, I, personally, I'm, I'm very interested in this field. Not, I mean, I think it's very important for that reason, <laughs> yeah. particularly because so many people are taking pharmaceuticals. And, but um, I, I don't personally take pharmaceuticals, but I do take things like turmeric, yeah. uh, curcumin, yeah. you know, these polyphenols, which are xenobiotics. And yeah. I'm interested in, like, can I take my curcumin at a certain time of day and it's more <laughs> yeah. effective, I get more bang for my buck, you know, because yeah. it's metabolized quickly. So yeah. I would like to find, you know, that time that window. Time window. Uh, that would be kind of cool. Yeah. So, okay. Um, I think I think we've covered the questions that are pretty frequently asked. Yeah, great. So, I, again, this um, getting back to the, the My Circadian Clock, I think it's sort of key because you're you're aggregating data from all over the world, right? Yeah. You have people now from So we have people from almost every continent except Antarctica. So oh, that would be cool. If, if somebody is going know. to Antarctica and really you are if, in, if you're in You Antarctica. need to get some of the researchers that are on <laughs> the, uh, yes. the station over there, yeah. the <laughs> research station. And we haven't hit the International Space Station yet. Okay. <laughs> That would be cool too. Yeah. That would be cool because you know in ISS they are going through a 90 minutes day night cycle because the space station makes one revolution around the Earth in every 90 minutes, so they see a sunrise and sunset <laughs> in wow. every 90 minutes, and uh, they are actually they are the ultimate shift workers. Right. And uh, we know that they struggle with it a lot. And uh, recently, the ISS is fitted with uh, circadian lighting, so they will go through a simulation of light dark cycle, not a light dark cycle, but blue light and wrist and red light and wrist, that kind of cycle. So we'll see how it improves their life.
Yeah. <laughs> so. that, that's really cool. Uh, for the data that you're aggregating, I guess, aside from people um, putting comments, which yeah. are probably extremely useful, you're yeah. learning obviously things like the IBS and yeah. all these things you're learning from people putting their comments. Is there any mode of tracking like cognitive function or mental function or is, is it just the comments that you're kind yeah, of Yeah, so on? we haven't uh, done anything. Actually, we are going to release a newer version of the app based on many comments that we received. Also, it will be a little bit more user-friendly, hopefully. Um, and yeah, so it, if we add more functionality to the app, then it becomes more complicated for a lot of people. Yeah. So that's yes. why we have to find that balance where um, we have to kind of stop <laughs> and then see the right balance, or maybe bring up some cognitive functions um, um, or link them, link our app to other apps that mm -hmm. do cognitive I'm just, functions. I'm personally curious on, in whether or not uh, time-restricted eating affects cognitive function, mental performance, um, and also just brain aging in general, you know, because we do know that shift workers, for example, shift workers that have worked like 10 years yeah. or more have like their brains age at like an like accelerated rate. Their yeah. brains look like six and a half years older than yeah. age match controls or something. Yeah. yeah. And I think there's some animal studies showing if you make mice eat when they're not supposed to eat, so when they're usually sleeping, so for yeah. them during the day, I think their like hippocampal yeah. function was like messed up or long term potentiation was messed up and learning memories. Yeah, so that, there are many studies done, for example in uh, high fat diet fed mice lot of uh, cognitive functions and social functions have been assessed. Mm -hmm. And we know high fat diet disrupts their circadian clock, they eat randomly. So in that way we know that there is already a deficit, there is already a problem with uh, brain function. And now they will, those kind of experiments will guide us to see if we give the same high fat diet within eight hours or nine hours to mice yeah. and we do the same assays, what will happen, whether we'll see improvement in benefits. So that's one set of experiment. The other set of experiments that will be very useful, and I, I'm sure somebody else must be doing it, because if I can think of an experiment somebody else is already yeah. doing it, that's to take all these animal models of Parkinson's disease mm -hmm. or Alzheimer's disease and then put them on time just yeah, to repeat it. Yeah, it seems obvious. And then see <laughs> whether the performance improves. Yeah. You know, uh, I'll not be surprised if we see these kind of studies coming out in the yeah. next six months or a year. Well, surely, I mean, if if, you're clearing away at the very least clearing away some of these protein aggregates because you're having a constant fasting period yeah then you if indeed those protein aggregates are affecting cognitive function yeah you would you would imagine that that would be improvement and also what we know from sleep research over the last three to three four years um, one of the big things that came out from sleep studies in the last few years is uh, we knew sleep improves learning and memory, uh, synaptic uh, plasticity, etc. Uh, but now we are learning that sleep actually improves um, cleansing the brain. So for example, the xenobiotics and other stuff, the gunk in the brain gets broken down and is clean during this sleep time. And uh, I would say that uh, there, is, there might be some aspect of fasting because of course in all these studies, the animals were eating less when they sleep. And so then the question is, how much of fasting contributed to cleansing the brain? You're talking about the glymphatic system The glymphatic being activated. system. And that then, would be super interesting. Yeah. That would so, be very interesting. So that's also another reason why we think that, well, maybe fasting is actually improving sleep by affecting maybe the xenobiotic metabolism yeah. or something else. So uh, it's kind of interesting that we did a very simple experiment <laughs> a few years ago, and now we have more questions than answers. And this is exciting. Yes, do you have any neurobiologists in your lab that would be interesting? Yeah, so in we, we are collaborating with uh, experts in this field who work on neurodegenerative disease uh, to see what is the impact of time restricted feeding on these mouse models. And of course, we cannot just take one mouse model, we have to use right. a multiple number of mouse models to make sure that this is, at least in mice, we can um, assess whether benefit or adverse effects on multiple strains, and then we can come to human yeah. studies. I know the glymphatic system is like one of the major ways the brain clears amyloid yeah. beta plaques. Yeah. Like you said, among other gunk and things yeah. that 
that's part of the gunk. I yeah. mean, so that would be extremely yeah. interesting to see if the, the your eating schedule also affected affected that as well. Um, definitely no shortage of interesting things to, no, to ask. No, no. <laughs> It'll so keep we, it um, easy for a while. You've got a, you've got a website? Yes, I have a website called mycicadianclog.org. And uh, that website has a lot of information as blogs and also in the first phase in the informed consent. What we do, we ask people to go through the informed consent to see what they are asked to do or what they may volunteer to do uh, as part of the study. They may give us some information about themselves. And in that way, we can relate. We, as we increase the number of ends, we have more participants. We'll always have some participants who belong to a certain age group, gender, or uh, socioeconomic conditions or demographic. So in that way, we can always figure out um, what is their existing lifestyle and what they tend to change, what they can change. Um, and then after the sign up, they get a um, they get the copy of informed consent in their email. So it's very important that you <laughs> give a uh, email address that actually works. We are not going to use the email for anything else, and we are actually overseen by a committee of ethics uh, ethics committee who reviews everything that we do. Any data that we even in future, if we want to share, it has to go through that ethics committee. It cannot be given to any entity for profit. And uh, so in that way, we maintain privacy very strongly. And then once they download the app and start collecting, one interesting thing is what we find. People hear about our study through podcast or other things, and they start doing time restricted eating from get go. So in that way, you don't get a uh, picture of snapshot of what was their lifestyle before mm -hmm. they adopted time restricted eating. So one request is for the first one or two weeks, it's better if they just continue their current lifestyle. Even if they were eating in the middle of the night once in a while, it's better to have that in record. So that we can say this was, then people can themselves compare. This was my lifestyle before. And then after two weeks, when they set their new goal, or if they say, well, I can do only 10 hours of eating, that's fine, or 12 hours, or even eight hours. Then we can compare how was life before <laughs> TRE and how is life after TRE, and we can compare those two. And um, what happens is, yes, uh, we ask uh, to log a lot of different things. Um, some people do it, and some people may not like to do it, but that's okay. If you, if people can log at least one thing, whether it's sleep, whether it's food, then that's much better than not logging at all. And then another thing that we notice is some people will get into the habit of time restricted eating for four to six weeks, and then they stop recording. And we know that they actually, they say, okay, I don't need this um, guidance, so I don't need to log this data, I can do it by myself, and that's fine. Uh, but for us, it'll be really nice if they can log at least the first or last, first and last meal um, for the rest uh, for up to 12 weeks, because all of these will help us to figure out whether you're actually falling off the wagon or you got it so that you don't have to do it for 12 weeks. So in the next version of the app or when we go to our ethics committee and ask permission, we'll say, well, you know, we are finding that people get used to it in six weeks. We don't have to ask them to monitor everything for 12 weeks. So all these things matter. And then once in a while, giving us some feedback. Uh, if you see some improvement, please share with us. If you see any adverse impact, that's much more important. Please share with us because then we'll know what are the adverse impact and we can report that to our committee and also we can go back to mouse and then see why this happened. And then at the end of 12 weeks, um, if people can record, say, their body weight or any other measures that they can record, then that will also help us. Uh, that will help us to go back to mouse or even report uh, include in their final publications because what we are foreseeing is we might begin to start publishing from the app from end of this year onwards. And there are many different ways one can um, dissect the data. So there are many different ways we can publish it. So the more information we have, what happened in response